Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Tony Butler. Tony is the founder of the digital marketing agency Can Do Ideas and the creator of the Primal Storytelling Content System. He is a highly regarded expert in brand storytelling and digital marketing. Tony graduated from West Point and the U.S. Army Ranger School. He is a combat veteran and commanded an infantry company in Iraq during the invasion of Baghdad. He's also a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. And I am excited to have him on the show to talk about the importance of brand storytelling. So, Tony, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, it's 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 an honor to have you. It's good to meet you, and uh, I'm really excited to talk about this subject. But before we dive in, I, I was just kind of curious: how does someone go about uh, going from you know being a, a com- you know commanding a company in Iraq, right, to becoming an expert in brand storytelling and digital marketing? How did you make that transition? What what <laughs> led you in that direction? Well, um, it started out desperation. <laughs> <laughs> Because when I made the transition, I didn't know what I want to do. And I made like every possible mistake you can make transitioning out of the military. I, my wife had a baby. We bought a house. I changed careers. We moved to a state I'd never been to all in the same month, you know? And so then we get there, we get settled in and I realized, oh my God, it's really expensive to live here. And there's no more, you know, I'm not living on base housing and, um, and I wasn't making enough money and, Mm -hmm. I was just starting my job and I realized I don't know anything about a civilian world. And I worked at this big defense contractor that made actually made equipment, electrical equipment for the Navy. Mm. I was a project manager there, but I wasn't making it. And I ended up pursuing entrepreneurship on the side with my job to try to make more money. So we could, we really, my wife and I really wanted her to stay home with our baby and raise our kids. And uh, so she was like, you better figure out how to make money. So that's, that's what got me started. And, you know, as you know, when you first try to start a business, you know, everything sucks and you don't know anything and you, you need to build skills. And I was lucky early on, I ended up transitioning into sales in the business and, you know, kind of found my calling there. And then I ended up a couple of jobs in the sales world. I, I took a couple of jobs, um, Started out just as a regular sales guy. 18 months later, I was a director of sales. Another year after that, I was a VP of sales and I helped scale the business from 16 million to 25 million. Um, after that, I ended up at a startup. And at the startup, you know, everyone's helping do something. And I was on the sales team, but I also started helping with some of the marketing and the messaging and, yeah. you know, trying to get leads and, you know, just all those questions that every business has is like, man, we got to grow. We need new, we need, we got to pay the rent, <laughs> you know? And that really woke me up with, Hey, how does a business run? You know, and without customers, you you, you can't stay alive. Like, you know, a new customer can, can save everything. It makes payroll. It pays everyone. It, you invest profit into growing a business, hiring a new employee. and Over the course of time, I just got deeper and deeper into marketing. And then I guess three or four jobs in, I I finally, I was appointed CEO of a company, an IT company in New York City. And I was at that job for a couple of years. The partners started to fight and they lawyered up. So I knew I was going to be leaving in the next few months because they were selling the company. Um, And so I was like, what would I like to do? And so I guess this was almost nine years ago, I started this agency, which is just a content marketing company, you know, so I help companies um, develop their digital marketing strategy using content. And, you know, my first two years in business, you know, we struggled, really struggled, you know, just trying to find our niche, just really trying to find our customer base and what we're really good at. And that led me, you know, just trying to get better and better. It led me to Primal Storytelling. Yeah. Um, Interesting. So it, it's funny that you say that, that your story is, is kind of similar to a lot of veterans who get out. You know, we sort of like for me, like my my lifelong dream was to be on submarines and be a submarine officer. And then after you do that, it's like, all right, I've achieved my life goal at 24 years old. Now, what do I do? What's you know, next? It's, right? it, it's really tough. I mean, it, and, and it took me a long time to find my 
groove. And it turns out for me, it was manufacturing. I love manufacturing. Get into, I got into that. But, um, but yeah, I think it's not uncommon for veterans to, to struggle to find, okay, what is it that I want to do in my life after doing some pretty amazing stuff in our, in our, you know, our, in our young careers in the military. So it doesn't surprise me with that. And I, and I think, you know, what your story talking about kind of, you know, if you found something you liked, something you're, you're interested in marketing and, uh, and then you find, a, found a niche that was special. And I think that's kind of fun that when you find that new purpose and new, you know, new direction for your, for what you want to do and what you love doing. So I'm excited to hear that. Um, tell us a little bit, um, you know, we're going to talk about primal storytelling in this episode. So tell us, uh, what is primal storytelling and how is that different from just normal storytelling? Yeah. So we're not trying to produce the great American novel. You know, it's not, it's not Stephen King, you know, in Salem's Lot. It's not that. What we're trying to do is start out with four base stories that every business can tell. And they start out with leadership stories. You know, the story of the founding, the origin story, like why did the business start in the first place? Mm. You know, and mo most of the time it's some entrepreneur, he saw a problem, he saw people who could serve and he jumps out there and tries to do something to do it, you know, scratching their own itch a lot of times. And, and tell that story, like where they came from, like what, were, why do they do it? And the next story is, it's what we think of as the vision story. What is the vision for the business? Like, what are you trying to do? You know, you're trying to change the world. Are you trying to put a new colony on Mars? <laughs> you know, that's SpaceX, their, their vision story. Think about this. Elon Musk was talking about putting someone on Mars before he'd ever designed his first rocket. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, the vision story it drove investment. It got people excited about coming to work for the company that didn't have a product. You know, it just this, this crazy idea that he had, but the vision was so big, he could attract people to it and get investors and people to work there. And, you know, 10 years later, he's putting people on the moon. Yeah. Um, now, not everyone's trying to go to Mars, but every entrepreneur has a vision for what they want to accomplish, you know, and it could be something small, but it just has to be important to you. And, and the reason we tell those two, those first two stories, origin and vision, is because that gives people kind of a, a way of connecting with a business that's not the faceless brand, okay? The subtitle of the book is Marketing for Humans. Mm. And it, it's important because if you ever go on LinkedIn and you look at company pages, you know, the company pages on LinkedIn are just a wasteland. Nobody follows them. They put up all kinds of content that no one would ever read. You know, they're marketing for the algorithm. They're not marketing for a person. They're not creating mm. content that's valuable that that you would want to read or I would want to read or or follow. But guess what? People follow what you do. You know, they, they they follow you as a person, John as a person. And that's the face of the brand. Now, as you get to larger companies and you know, maybe the founder is no longer in charge. Maybe the company's been around a hundred years and the founding story is way behind them. Okay. You can still tell the story. It will still help connect, but then you have to add another thing in there. You need a narrative voice, you know, a face of the company in some way that's a person or a persona of some sort. So like, if you think of uh, the Geico gecko, all right. So insurance, the most boring business ever. Like every insurance company does the exact same thing, right? There's no difference in insurance. Maybe it's $5 difference, but the gecko has been driving billions of dollars in revenue because people identify with the character, the human yeah. traits, the personification of this little cute animal, right? <laughs> Did you see my, my where I'm headed with it? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we our last episode was on personal branding, and so and mm -hmm. our and our guest was talking about that. Is that you got to put a face to the business? And what she was encouraging absolutely. is that you know employees of of a business need to talk about what they do in their company on LinkedIn for, for more people to say, okay, there's, there's people that work here and that this is their experience working for, you know, SpaceX or whatever. And, and so there, it's not just um, a faceless company, there's faces exactly. associated with it. And I think that that's your, 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 you're kind of saying the same thing. It's like, we don't want a faceless company. We want to see a person. We want to hear the origin story. We want to know where you're, where you're headed. And uh, we That's don't right. want to see those boring company pages. I have one uh, for my company and I don't do anything with it. I just sort of have it out there, <laughs> but uh, we don't do much with it because like you said, nobody's going to follow it. Nobody really cares. 
Yeah, that, that's right. And so then is the transition transformation stories. Mm. Okay. The customers that you've helped, what were they like before they met you or your products? You know, what was it like working with you? And then what happened afterwards? You know, and like, think, think of like in the weight loss industry, every, every fitness trainer shows the before and after, you know, where right, someone right. super, mo super obese, and then they're ready for the Olympia. And they're like, you know, they're big and strong and they got six pack abs. Right. Well, not everyone has that dramatic of a visual, but you have stories of happy customers or you're not staying in business very long, right? You have customers that, you know, are singing your praises and it's important to tell those stories in a powerful way so that other people can say, you know what? I worked with John. He helped me a lot. And you know what, Mary, you should work with him too, mm -hmm. because then it helps them find you. It helps them connect. And, you know, word of mouth matters in your tribe and your people in your network. It, it really matters. And that's why getting referrals and testimonials are so powerful. Like we want to do business with people that we know and people that we trust. And a referral is a trusted, it's a trusted thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's actually where most of my business came from as we started up this business was we would let land one customer in a region and they would tell the other customers in that region. Then we'd just have these hot spots around the country where we'd have a lot of customers. And then there were some places where we didn't have any cu customers and it was just a wasteland, you know, and we just have to get that one and make them, you know, get them happy with our products. And then next thing you know, we have a cluster, uh, you know, of customers in a particular region. And uh, as a small company, that's a great way to grow is through referrals and through, you know, happy customers and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, I think it's great. And, and uh, you're touching on a lot of really important points. And one of the things I was going to ask you is, you know, um, we're all trying to, I mean, I think you even have it on in your book. You say that there's 1.5 billion websites globally. And you think about the amount of daily uh, blog posts, uh, social media posts. I mean, it's just, there's so much noise. And, um, and most brands sort of, you know, they fail to get noticed. They get lost in all that noise. And what would you say some of the mistakes that, that most brands fall into when, they, when they're trying to get their voice heard and they sort of just disappear in that noise? Yeah, the, the biggest mistake is they try to write content, produce blogs and social media posts that are just random acts of marketing. There's no strategy behind it. They're mm -hmm. trying to be part of some invisible conversation online where they think they have to post just so they're posting, you know, and you see lots of these SEO companies that are like borderline scam or like you should post two blogs a week and that'll help the search engine. You know, they're like, well, guess what? Who are those blogs actually for? Like what value is it bringing the world? You know, and if you're just reporting on the industry news that 50 other companies, a hundred other, you know, in some industries, 10,000 other companies are reporting on, then how is that getting you noticed? It's not. Mm -hmm is that having meaning behind what you're posting and then connecting it to an audience, connecting it to a tribe in a way that's valuable for them. You know, and I think one of the key aspects of the book is thinking differently about what you can actually produce mm -hmm. for your audience. You know, so if, if you're in the electrical industry and let's say your clients are construction companies, you know, and I, I don't know your business at all, you could produce content for the, the executives in the construction company if you wanted to. And it doesn't have to be anything about electrical stuff. It could be about anything else. It could be on leadership. You could do a leadership development course for them. You could do content on how to hire and train the best employees. Like there's lots of ways they can do it just to think bigger about it. Um, USAA has a content program that I think is really interesting. If you go on their website, so USAA is an insurance company. I, I don't know if you've ever you heard of them or used them. Oh, yeah. No, I've been with them for a long time. <laughs> yeah, me too. I've been with them like 30 years. Okay. Yeah. Well, they only service military members and their families. Okay. And it used to be they only served officers and they expanded to enlisted and then right. they expanded yep. to the family members and now extended family, I think kids. But if you go on their website and you look at content, they have all kinds of content in there that has nothing to do with insurance. Hey, how to, how to transition out of the military and find a job? You know, what do you do if you want to try to get in the military, but you're out of shape, like how to get in shape to get, to get in the military, you know, really interesting. And it's, 
it's not relevant to their business, but it's helpful for their clients. And I, I think that's the actual, like the core of it, the seed that's powerful. And any company could do that. You just have to think bigger about your audience. I know for our business, one of the things we did was we 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 created a knowledge center on our website and it's sort of even hidden. You don't, you can't even quite find it. But what we did was we, we, we sat down and brainstormed for, you know, several months and we said, what are the questions that young engineers in our industry are asking? And we listed, we just went through and then we wrote small articles answering those questions and like, how do I size a CT? How do I, uh, how do I double the output of a current transformer in this kind of configuration? So we, we a lot of technical stuff, but we, we, yep. we answered those in short articles. We had our engineering department sort of answered them and we just sort of crafted them into small, short articles. And um, what's interesting is a lot of people find us through those through, you know, going to Google and they're trying to answer a question and suddenly our little article shows up and next thing you know, they're contacting us because we're a subject matter expert and we may not, we may not necessarily be, but right. we, we were thinking about like, what are the kind of questions and challenges that young engineers face when they're looking, you know, to, to, for products like that we, that we produce. And, and, and it's kind of interesting. It's, it, it's made us, in fact, uh, now we go and we train all of the the technicians in these uh, in these companies because we're seen as a subject matter expert, and and we we are obviously we know our products very well, but but we're we're seen as that mostly because of the content that we have out there and that people are, are you know they share it they read it they you know they call us to ask more questions. So it's interesting that um, like you said, it's it's uh, how do we it's and we're not trying to sell anything either in that content. Right. We're just literally just answering the type of questions that young engineers would have. Uh, in mm -hmm. this industry. So you could even take it a step farther, go through, pick the top 20 articles and combine them into an ebook. Yeah. 20 tips and tricks for, and then think of like, what's the overarching subject, you know, 20 tips and tricks for electrical engineers just out of college, something like that. Yeah. And put that out there for free and run little small ads against an audience that's for engineers and build yourself a big list of mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, or whoever it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's really good. That's really, I, I love it. I love what you're talking about. It's just, is it's putting stuff out there that is not noise. You know, it's not. Exactly. And one of the things that, that bothers me sometimes is brands will talk about like, oh, you know, happy new year, you know, or, or, you know, it's every holiday they've got something, you know, on there. And, and, uh, and it's like, is that relevant or is it just filler you know somebody's got a quota i've got to get six posts a day and you know this one's going to be you know whatever ha happy whatever day well, it is. all right so donut day let, let's let's think about and you just hit you just hit like a, a sore spot with me <laughs> so why do big brands wish people happy valentine's day it's just taking up noise of the internet. It's not getting them business. It's not helping anyone. It's not adding to the world. It's not adding to happiness. Like there's no purpose in that other than the social media team doesn't know what to post. So they post something that's from the calendar. <laughs> yeah. You know, and one of the most ridiculous things I see at companies is they have these, uh, these giant Excel spreadsheets with every minor holiday that you could have. And I actually, yeah. I'm actually guilty of this. I did one for, I did a, a promotion for a financial company, which was happy pistachio day. Oh, nice. Yeah. How ridiculous and stupid is that? <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and, you know, this is back when I was still struggling to really understand like how to bring value through marketing. And what I realized it was, is that, and this comes back to the fourth story and it's the value story. Mm. And it's creating content that's valuable for a specific audience. You know, my, my one piece of advice for every business, whether they read my book or don't, is like deeply understand who you're selling to. Who's your best client? Like, who's the client you love to work with? Okay, like model them. You know, mo model them as people, model them as a business, and then go out and find others like them. Okay, mm -hmm. because if you can do business with people you love and you can deliver an excellent service to them. That's a really good value. Like that's how you grow a business. I, I've had clients for years, five, six, seven years at a time. Okay. When you keep a client for seven years and they're paying you a lot of money every year, you, you don't suck. 
Okay, mm -hmm. right? You you're doing good service. Okay. They stay with you. No business is going to stay with a service for a really long period of time unless they're really getting excellence out of it. And that's how you build a backbone. And you know mm -hmm. what? I got my clients are my friends. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so the book the book is is fantastic. The uh, primal storytelling marketing for humans. Um, you just mentioned something in there, and it's one of the things I was going to ask you about is tribes. What what are tribes? Why are they important when we're talking about um, marketing for humans? Yeah, so tribes are two different levels. They're groups of people where we understand and define their demographics and their psychographics. So the demographics that's you know how old are you? Where do you live? Did you go to college? You know, what kind of college? You know, that kind of thing. And then the psychographics is something completely different. It's a psychological profile of someone. You know, what are their hopes and dreams? What mm -hmm. are they afraid of? Like, why, why might they be nervous about working with you? You know, like if you're sitting in front of a buying manager and all they can think of is, hey, if I hire Tony, do I get fired? Like, that's that's a real concern that you have to overcome. Like, you gotta, you gotta show credibility. You have to. You have to think deeply about them as people and mm. what what they're worried about. And once I understand a niche's psychographics, then it's much easier to then think, okay, what content can we produce for them? How can we make it valuable? How can we find them? Are they on are they on LinkedIn? Are they on Facebook? Are they on Instagram? You know, there's lots of channels out there. Um, and channel agnostic is understanding that value doesn't matter if it, what channel it's going on. Like you can, you can put something on Twitter that has value and you can put that same thing in a different form on YouTube or any other channel. 10 years from now, there's going to be five new social media channels that haven't been invented yet. And guess what? Valuable stories and valuable content will still work on them. Mm. Okay. So it's not, so what you're saying is it's not the, it's not the social media channel. It's the message that you want to be telling and it's got right. to connect with your, your tribe. Uh, if, as you, as you talk about it in the book and you think about it, are there some, some companies that truly understand this, you know, uh, primal storytelling and do a really good job with it? There, there's lots of companies out there that are doing a good job. I think the one example I give in the book is Harley Davidson. Mm. They know exactly who their clients are and what their clients are looking for, what makes them happy. You know, there, there's a reason that, you know, some of these big brands, they, maybe they create a luxury item and they don't have an item that's low cost. Okay. Why, why do they do that? Because their tribe is people who want something elite, mm. right? Like think of like who buys a Rolex watch. Okay. How much does a Rolex cost? Well, it can cost 10,000, 20,000, 50,000. I know there's hundred thousand dollar watches out there, million dollar watches. Well, who who is buying a million dollar watch, and why do they buy it? They buy it for the signal it sends. They buy it for how it makes them feel, right? Mm -hmm. So why do you buy a five dollar watch versus a million dollar watch? They both tell time. You know, it, it's it has something to do with your place within your tribe, and how it makes you feel to wear it or consume it or drive it or anything else. Okay. Yeah, I, I, Harley, Harley Davidson is such a great example of just, you know, you've got your customers tattooing your logo, your oh, logo yeah. on their body, right? And and wearing right. wearing your logo on their gear and, and, and stickers on their trailers. And you're like, holy cow, like I don't, as a marketing manager, Harley Davidson, you're like, I, I win. <laughs> I win. That's right. It's, it's because so, you have a very loyal tribe. Uh, and I've even seen that with... Um, you know, with with various products where where there's a there's a brand loyalty, even in 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 B two B businesses, I've seen that where people um, will where customers will gravitate towards one brand, and they're like proud to say we only buy this brand, and and uh, and and it's they've they've identified with that brand uh, because the brand has done a really good job with their messaging as to why you should you know uh, well what happens is they pull their customers in. So their customers feel like they're part of a movement. Yeah, so if you think yeah. of like when, when Apple first got started and there's these, all these Apple crazy people out there, you know, the, think back when the iPhone three came out, you know, mm. there were lines around the block, people were waiting to get the new iPhone and then iPhone four, then five. And now they're on like 10 or whatever the newest number is. 
And what does an iPhone cost these days? I think like twelve hundred dollars for it's an iPhone. Crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, a lot of money. But guess what? The day they come out, they're selling tens of thousands of iPhones a minute. Not 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 a day, a minute. Yeah. And that's because people are fanatics. They 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 want to have the newest. They love their iPhone. Yeah. And yeah. it's one of those where you connect something that it's a signal to everyone around you. It's it's part of your group. It's part of your tribe. Mm -hmm. You know, and we we want to be we we want to have a social um our social status. That's part of it. It's a big mm -hmm. part of it. You, you uh, in the book, you talk about a primal storytelling formula. What does that look like? So the primal storytelling formula has three parts. Okay. So the first part is what we were talking about is defining the tribe. So you take the tribe and then plus what I call primal urges and mm. emotions. Okay. So primal urges are it, humans. We have the vestiges of instincts left in us. So an instinct is a genetically engineered you know, action. So geese fly south for the winter. They can't fly east. They can't fly west. They can't go to vacation in Hawaii. They have to fly south. You know, squirrels, they collect nuts. The bears hibernate, you know, instincts. They, they can't overcome them. Humans, we don't have that anymore. We have free will. But we still have the vestiges of our instincts. I call these primal urges. You know, we, we still want to, we're, we're social animals. You know, we want how we feel within our social group is really important. Okay. So we, our social signals are a lot to us Our, you know, we, we have urges to mate. We have urges for safety, for protection, you know, all of these things that psychological are part of our makeup and they dramatically influence our body and behavior, mm. you know? And so like, like as an example, I, I mentioned safety and protection. It's not just physical safety. It's mental safety. It's feeling safe about the things and the decisions that you're making. You know, and like sometimes you'll get someone who will buy something that they know is inferior, but they trust it. And something over here that they haven't tried before that they they think probably is better, but they're just not quite, the trust is just not quite there. They won't buy it. They just won't. They yeah, won't take that yeah. chance. Yeah. You know? um, in Inside of every person and a decision they make, there's a wall of fear. Yeah. And before you can get them to buy something, you have to get through that wall. And that's like you mm -hmm. mentioned, hey, answering their questions, you know, building credibility, mm -hmm. uh, understanding, like, can you really help them in a, in a meaningful way? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting that you say that because I think in, in my industry, we sell to electric utilities and they have a major fear of an outage, right? That's that's their biggest yeah. fear. So Absolutely. don't make me lose power to my customers, right? And so they are very slow to change because they they're they're very conservative. They don't what they have works, and they don't want to put anything on their network that's going to cause power to go off because that's how they're measured. Of anything else, it's it's how they're measured, and right. so they're very conservative. And so just like you said, there's there's that that primal urge. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to get fired. I don't want to get, uh, 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 you know, pointed out for failing to, to buy the safe choice, which is right. maybe inferior, but it's proven, right. Exactly. As opposed to this new company, my, my company, I, I've never heard of you guys, even though we've got decades in the industry from other companies, but I've never heard of your brand. Right. So I'm, I'm nervous well, on switching. Yeah, back back in the day, IBM used to have this line that their sales reps would use was, yeah. "No one ever got fired choosing IBM because they were number one, right?" Right. And you know that those primal urges and emotions. So the first part of the formula, tribe, primal urges and emotions, identifying those within the tribe, and then the fourth, the, th the third part there is the storylines. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I outline different plots that companies can use in different situations and for different reasons that will just help them structure the content they're creating, you know, help them think through and, you know, lay out a calendar for a whole year and just come up with a strategic content system for to, to grow their business. Um, yeah, that's the three parts. That's fantastic. And, you know, and, and we've got a lot of leaders listening in and, um, you know, um, 
what's their role in it? So, you know, you, maybe you're not the marketing guy, but you have a marketing team underneath you. Maybe you're running a small business, you're running, a, you're an entrepreneur. What's the, what, what should the leader's role be in making sure that their, their team is doing the right thing with respect to, to content marketing? Yeah. The first thing is to think bigger about the content you're producing. Mm. Like the, the tendency for most business owners is they only want to, they only want their marketing team to talk about what they do. Me, 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 me. Okay. Push it out. Think about your clients. Think about them as people. Mm. Like what are they interested in? Find a way that you can connect that audience with your company. Okay. So think of it like um, sponsorships, you know, big brand, they put their name on a stadium. You know, or maybe at the local level, they sponsor the local track team, the local football team, and their their name is up. It's being associated with the football team. Okay, well, why why does that why is that valuable? Like, how can it help? Well, you're associating a local brand with a sports team, and and people start to they start to see it. They start to get brand awareness. They start to connect. Then when they see an ad from you, they're more likely to consume it. It feels familiar. It feels trusted. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And if you're doing it from a content marketing portion, it by widening and pushing out what you're going to, you know, you know, what you're going to create, it gives you a much bigger, you know, a much, a much, much bigger field of things that you can actually produce, you know? So instead of just talking about marketing, Tony Butler, I can talk about Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You know, I, um, I, I teach jiu-jitsu. I can talk about mental toughness. Mm. I can talk about, hey, it's lonely running a business and growing it. And, you know, what do I do when things go wrong or I'm, I'm struggling to make payroll and all those hard things that every entrepreneur goes through. So I can talk about entrepreneurship. And all of these kinds of things are of interest to my clients who are primarily business owners and marketers. Mm. You know, maybe they're, maybe they have an agency and they want to, they want to produce content, so they might follow me. Well, they also have issues that I know about. You know, so like I was just saying, you know, one of the things that every entrepreneur runs into is, hey, how do I get it all done? So I, I personally, I have a, I have a morning schedule that I follow that's really, really, really dialed in, very, very disciplined. I have a whole day that's like scheduled out, like to the minute. <laughs> um, you know, as you know, I'm a West Point grad, and I'm pretty <laughs> anal. <laughs> um, but it has really served me well by having structure in my day and it's, it's kept me fit into my fifties. It's kept me, you know, running multiple business simultaneously consulting with dozens of business at any given time, like, and to be really productive. Well, guess what? That's content that I can produce that has nothing to do with marketing. Mm. You, you see it? It's, yeah, it's, it's, connection. It's, the human, it's the human connection too. They're seeing a real person. And That's right. I like what you said too, and consistent with our guest last week, which was the, the 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 ups and downs. Not like you know, not all the greatest hits. It's the struggles, the frustrations, the Absolutely. because you're then people associate you know you as being a real person, real authentic uh, authenticity. And you're like, oh yeah, I struggle with that as well, you know, or yeah, exactly. uh, that's a great point. I, you know, how do we, you know, but that's something I'm dealing with too. So you're, you're, you're a real person and there's a connection there. So you, so there's a real, like you said, you put a face to the the brand and there's a connection there. And I think that's uh, and, and like you said, it's marketing for humans. It's human to human connection and not a that's human to exactly. company. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Well, this has been a, a, a great discussion. And uh, the name of the book is Primal Storytelling, Marketing for Humans. It is a number one bestseller on Amazon. I noticed, by the way, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, it's a fantastic book. I've gone through it. I think there's so much stuff here. We really just sort of scratched the surface of this. And I really encourage you, if you're a small business, if, you, uh, uh, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to just try to get above the noise, you've got to look at these uh, the ideas that are in this book, because I think it really helps us to elevate ourselves and get a voice that uh, people are going to pay attention to. So you don't get lost in all that traffic and, uh, and all that noise. So Tony, how can people find out more about you, uh, this book and, and your company? Well, uh, primalstorytelling.com. That's the, that's the main website for the book. And then me personally, I primarily use LinkedIn and Instagram. So I'm just Anthony L Butler on LinkedIn and feel free to reach out to me and uh, connect. 
Okay, sounds good. And we're going to go ahead and put links in the show notes for all those resources. Tony, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate your your service, uh, everything you've done. And, and we really didn't even get into all that you did in the service. And I, I'm sure that from a leadership standpoint, that's fascinating to me. But we're going to probably have to have you back on to talk about those lessons. And of course, uh, jujitsu being a black belt, that is no easy task as well. So mental toughness and also physical toughness is a part of that. And uh, I'd love to have you back on the show and talk a little bit more on the other side of uh, business, which is the leadership side and, and some of the things that you learned throughout your career in the military and all the things you've done. But uh, but I do appreciate you coming on the show and sharing this new book, sharing this idea of primal storytelling. I think it's really important for all of our listeners. So thanks for coming on the show. Well, thanks, John. I appreciate you having me and I'll come back anytime. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.